from the Corinium Chief Analytics Officer Conference, Spring, San Francisco. It's the Cube. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're in downtown San Francisco at the Corinium Chief Analytics Officer Spring event, about 100 uh, CAOs as opposed to CDOs, talking about big data and transformation and analytics and the role of analytics and a lot of practitioners. We're really excited to have our next guest. He's up from Mexico City. It's Jose Murillo. He's the Chief Analytics Officer from Benorte. Jose, great to see you. Oh, thank you for having me, Jeff. Absolutely. Nice so for here. people who aren't familiar with uh, Benorte, give us a quick overview. Banorte is the second largest financial group in uh, Mexico. We, for the last, uh, during the last three years, we were able to leapfrog Citibank and Santander. Congratulations. And, uh, and as we were talking before we turned the cameras on, you and your projects had a big part of that. So before we get in it, you are a chief analytics officer. How did you come in? What's the reporting structure? How do you work within the broader spectrum of the, of the bank? Well, I, uh, Moved to Banorte like about five years ago. From uh, I was working at the central bank, where I uh, spent about uh, ten years in the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, uh, and I was invited by initially by the president of the board. And when a new chief operating officer was named, he invited me to uh, to lead a new analytics business unit that he wanted to create. Uh, and that's the way that I arrived there. Okay, so you report then to the COO. He's the COO slash CFO. Slash CFO. And, uh, so he's uh, not only a very smart guy, but a very powerful guy right, within right. the organization. And does the CIO also report to him? The CIO, the CDO, the CMO report to, to him. Okay, so you have a CDO as well, Chief Data we Officer. We have a CDO who we, I work very close to, uh, with, with him. <laughs> we could go for a long time. I yeah. might not let you leave for lunch. So I'm just curious on, on the relationship between the CDO and the CAO, the Data Officer and the Analytics Officer. We often hear one or the other. It's very seldom that I've heard both. So how do you guys divide and conquer your responsibilities? How do you parse that out? I guess he uh, he provides the foundation that we need uh, to find the uh, analytics projects that are going to transform the financial group, and he has uh, uh, been a very uh, good partner in providing the data that we need. And basically, what we do as the CAO, we find those opportunities to uh, improve the efficiency, to bring the customer to the center, and be able to deliver value to our stakeholders. Right, so he's really kind of giving you the infrastructure, if you will, of making that data available, getting it to you from all the various sources, et cetera, that then you can use for your analytics magic on top. Exactly. Okay, so so that's very good. So when we sat down, you said an exciting report has come out from, I believe it was HBR, about the tremendous ROI that you guys have realized. So I, you tell the story better than I. What do they What do they find in your uh, in your recent article? Well, in the recent article from the Harvard Business Review is uh, uh, how Banorte has made its analytics business unit pay off, and uh, what we have found in the past. Uh, Three and a half years, is we've been able to deliver massive value, and uh, by now we have surpassed a, a billion dollars in uh, net income creation from uh, uh, analytics projects made on um, cost saving strategies and revenue generating projects. So you should pay for yourself just barely. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean that's great. It's such a great story. Just barely, <laughs> just barely, because it's it's so it's so important. So. As you said, that billion dollars has been realized both in cost savings, but more importantly, on incremental revenue. And that's really the most important thing. Exactly. So how are you measuring that ROI? So basically, the, the way we measure it is on um, cost saving strategies that are uh, related to uh, uh, risk, uh, operational, and financial costs. It's the contemporaneous effect, and that can be audited. Right, right. And on the other side, on revenue generating projects, the way we do it is we estimate the customer lifetime value, which is nothing, uh, nothing else than the net uh, present value of the relationship with our customers. So right, we need right. to estimate survival rates plus the, the depth of our relationship with our customers. So I just love, so you're doing all kinds of projects, you're measuring the value of the projects. What are, what are some of the projects that had a high ROI that you would have never guessed that, that you guys applied some analytics to and said, wow, terrific value relative to what we expected. 
Let me tell you about two types of projects. The first project that we started on was on um, cost of risk uh, cutting uh, strategies and we delivered massive value and very quickly. So that helped us gain credibility and the way we do it, we, we did it is like to analyze uh, and uh, the dicing of and dicing of the data where we had excessive cost of risk and uh, in the first year actually that was the first quarter of operations we yielded about uh, a 25 percent incremental value to the credit card business and after that we uh, we started to work with them and started the discovery data process right and uh, from there we were able to optimize analytically the cross-sell process and uh, that's a project that has already a three-year maturity and at, by this time we are we are able to sell without having any bricks or mortars about uh, 25 percent of the credit cards sold by the the financial group uh, where if we were a territory within the financial group right we would be the largest one with a uh, uh, 400 basis points lower on uh, cost of risk, 30% more on activation rates, and uh, it's no surprise that the acquisition cost is 30% less vis-a-vis -vis our most efficient right, channel. Right, I just want to keep digging down into this, Jose. There's a lot of stuff <laughs> to go. I mean, you guys have been, you've been issuing cards forever, so was it just a, 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 a better way to score customers? Was it a better way to avoid the, the big fraud customers? Was it a better way to to steal customers maybe from a competitor with a, with a competitive rate that you can afford? I mean, what are some of the factors that allowed you to grow this business in such a big way? I guess it's it's a, it's a, something that has been improving during these three, the first three years. The first thing is that we made like a, a very simple cascade on seeing where why we were not that efficient in our cross-sell process. And we kind of fixed every every part of it like on on the income estimation models that we had with uh, uh, and uh, we partnered with the risk department to improve them up to the the information that we had on, on our customers to contact them and we partnered with data governance to improve the those and finally on on the delivery process and and all the the engaging process process with the customers and uh, it seemed that we were going to, to find something that was going to be more costly, but it was something that was, we had at the center of the customer so that it was more likely for them to go and uh, pick up the card and uh, you know, right. we deliver it to, the, to their homes. And finally that process was uh, much more efficient and the gains that we had, we, we shared them with our customers. And, and after three years, we've done things with artificial intelligence to to have much better scripts uh, so that we, we are better able to serve our customers. We do a lot of experimentations, that, uh, experimentation that we didn't do before. Right, right. And we use some uh, concepts from uh, behavioral economics to try to, uh, to explain much better the value proposition to our customers. So I just, I love uh, this point, is that it was a bunch of small was optimizing lots of little steps and little pieces of the pie that added up to such a significant thing. It wasn't like this magic AI uh, pixie it, dust, right? Initially it was a big bang, right? and then it has been something incremental that has since, it's a project that at the end of the day we own, right? and, uh, and it's something that we are tracking. We are willing to put all the effort to have all the incremental, incremental efficiency within the process. So people, process, and technology, we talk about those are the three pieces always to drive organizational change. And usually the, the technology is the easy part. The, the hard part is the people in the process. So as you and your team have started to work with the various lines of businesses for all these different pieces, promotional piece, customer retention piece, risk and governance piece, cross-sell piece, how has their attitude towards your group changed over time as you've started to deliver insight and in all this incremental deltas into their business. I guess you're hitting on the just on the spot. The building the models is the easy part. The hard part is to build the consensus around uh, a, to to change a process that has run for 20 years. There's a lot of inertia, right? Right. And there are a lot of silos within organizations. 
So initially, I guess, uh, the credibility that we gained initially uh, helped us uh, move faster. Right. And at the end of the day, I think what happens is that we, uh, the way that we are set up is that the incentives are very well aligned with, within the, the different uh, units that need to interact in the sense that we are a unit that it's uh, sponsored by the, uh, corporately sponsored, and, uh, and we, add, we make it easier for our partners to attain their, their goals. Right. So that's, uh, and they don't share the cost of the, right. of, uh, of us, so and, that's. And that those helps. are the goals they already had, so, so you, you're basically helping them achieve their objectives that they already had better and more efficiently. Yeah, and and but and, and you are pointing out correctly. It's it's the people, and it's it's a uh, right. b besides the math, it's a highly, you could say, diplomatic or political uh, position in the sense that you need to have all the different uh, partners and stakeholders aligned to to change something that has uh, been running for twenty years. Right, right. right. I just love, and I just love <laughs> it's a ton of little marginal improvements yeah. across a wide variety of touch points. It's so so. So impactful. So, what do you, as you look forward now, um, is there another big bang out there, or do you just see kind of this constant um, march of incremental improvement, and/or are you just going to start getting into more different businesses or kind of different areas in the bank to apply the same process? Where well, do you go we, next? Well, we started with uh, the credit card business, but we moved to all the verticals within the the financial group, from uh, uh, mortgages, auto loans, payroll loans, uh, to uh, we are working with the insurance company, the long-term savings company. So we've uh, increased our uh, the scope of the of the group, and uh, we moved not only from cost to, to revenue generation uh, generating projects. And so far, it has been on a we have been on an exponential increase of of our impact. I guess that's the big question. On the first year, we we were able to do 46 times our cost. The second year, we we made 106 times our cost. The third year, we were close to a 200 times our cost with an incremental base, and so far we we've been on this increasing slide. At some point, it's uh, I guess we're going to decel decelerate, but uh, so right. far we haven't. Right, uh, a lot of big numbers. Hit that eventually, point. you got to <laughs> <you know, laughs> yeah. the growth eventually, curve yeah. will slow down a little bit. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, I give you the last word uh, before we sign off here. Kind of tips and tricks that you would share with a peer. We're sitting around on a Friday afternoon on the back porch, you know, as you've gone through this journey three and a half years and, and really sold you and your vision into the company. What would you share with a peer that's kind of starting this journey or starting to run into some of the early hurdles to get past? I think there are two things that I, that I could share. And once you have uh, built uh, uh, a group like this and you have the, already the incentives aligned and you have support from the top in the sense that they know that there's no other way they want really to compete and, uh, and be successful. And suppose that you have all these preconditions set up and suddenly you have a, a bunch of really smart people that are coming to a company and uh, so you need to focus on ROI, high ROI projects. It's very easy to get distracted on, on uh, non-impactful uh, projects. And I guess the, the most important thing is that you have to learn to say no to a lot of, to a lot of things. <laughs> Speaking my language, I love it. <laughs> learn to say no, it's the most important thing you'll ever learn. <laughs> yes. All right, well, uh, Jose, thanks for, uh, for spending a few minutes and congratulations on all your success. What a great story. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Absolutely, he's Jose, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE from the Corium Chief Analytics Officer Summit in downtown San Francisco. <laughs>